everyone and welcome to today's webinar entitled Structural Racism in Brazil and in the US. My name is Marcia Castro. I'm the Andalot Professor of Demography at the Harvard T.H. Chin School of Public Health, where I serve as chair of the Department of Global Health and Population. I also have the pleasure of chairing the Brazil Studies Program at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin America Studies. I'm going to be your moderator today. Racism is deeply embedded in systems, laws, policies, practices, and beliefs that produce and perpetuate unfair treatment and oppression of people of color. This has adverse health consequences. During epidemics and pandemics, those consequences are illuminated and exacerbated. The COVID-19 pandemic brought those issues to light. Brazil and the United States share significant aspects of their colonial histories, legacies of slavery, and the resulting structural racism that permeates their institutions. A comparative look at these countries may shed light on the consequences of structural racism and potential ways to mitigate it. Those are some of the issues we'll discuss in today's we um, webinar. And we have two stellar speakers whom I'm pleased and honored to introduce in the order in which they will present. David Williams is the Florence Brake Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health and the Chair of the Department of Social and Behavior Sciences here at the School of Public Health. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized social scientist focused on social influences on health. His research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can affect health. The everyday discrimination scale that he developed is the most widely used measure of discrimination in health studies. Silvio Almeida is the Edward Larocque Thinker Visiting Professor at the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. His research is based on four aspects, the relationship between philosophy of law and economic theories, structural racism, state and law in Brazilian social thought, and compliance and anti-discrimination practices. He's a political columnist for the Folha de São Paulo newspaper, one of the most important newspapers in Brazil. Dr. Almeida is a lawyer, political activist, and currently is the president of the Luis Gama Institute, an NGO dedicated to the defense of human rights in Brazil. Today's event is being presented in collaboration with the Lemon Center for Brazilian Studies at Columbia University, Harvard's Afro-Latin American Research Institute, the Department of Global Health and Population, and the Department of Social and Behavior Sciences here at the School of Public Health. A few housekeeping items before we start. We will record today's webinar and publish it on the Dr. Class YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also email a link of the recording to all those who registered for the event. We hope to see you at some of our other events that are coming in the chat. We'll have added links to our online calendar as well as our social media channels. I encourage you to follow us um, and get the most updated information on upcoming events. We would love to hear from you today. If you have a question for our speakers, please send it through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll have Q&A at the end after our two speakers have made their initial remarks, but please feel free to send your questions at any time. Without further ado, I'd like to begin by welcoming our first speaker, my colleague, David Williams. Thank you, um, my colleague, Professor Marcia Castro. It's an honor to be here and to talk about the topic of uh, structural racism um, in the United States. And I'm a, a public health researcher, so I will focus and make it concrete by showing how it all plays out uh, in the context of health and health inequities. So I'm going to share my screen so you can follow um, me as I talk about structural uh, racism. Um, uh, Professor uh, Castro mentioned um, COVID-19 and the way in which it shed light on the challenges of, of racial ethnic inequities in the United States. Here is one example. These are age-adjusted odds ratios uh, uh, for mortality rates by racial ethnic group. The comparison group is whites. 
And what you can see is the historically disadvantaged populations, the indigenous population, the Latino population, the black population, the Pacific Islander population in the United States, all of them had death rates that were at least two, two to 2.6 times higher than that of the white population. At the same time, I, I think it's important for people to keep in mind that even though the rates were higher uh, for the disadvantaged populations, because they are much smaller populations, the overwhelming majority of persons who were died, and these are data through March 2, 2021, the numbers are, are double what, well, almost double what they were then, but the overwhelming majority of the persons who have died were in fact white, nearly 300,000 whites had died compared to about 90,000 Latinos and 73,000 uh, blacks or African Americans. I'll use those terms interchangeably. I want to just illustrate the impact that COVID-19 has had on the overall health profile of the United States. If we look at life expectancy at birth from 2019 to 2020, we see the impact of the pandemic and we see large declines in life expectancy overall that are, uh, the declines were largest among the black and the Latino or Hispanic population in the United States. So you can see a decline of 3.7 years for Hispanic males, 3.3 years for black males, um, 2.4 years for black females, and two years uh, for Hispanic females, and over a year uh, for white males and females. Importantly, we have not seen declines of this magnitude from one year to the next since the early 1940s. So it's quite a historic uh, trend we have seen of the negative impact that has been disproportionate on historically disadvantaged populations. Well, how do we make sense of racial inequities in health? Well, I would begin by reflecting on the fact that there are large racial inequities, uh, large inequities in health by socioeconomic status, by that I mean income, education, occupational status, and wealth, in the United States and virtually everywhere else in the world where we have data. Persons of higher uh, socioeconomic status tend to have better health than those of lower socioeconomic status. And then there are large racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status, so that should be a clue as to why we see racial ethnic differences in health. To illustrate the differences, I'm going to show you data on income. This is national data on income, median household income in the United States by race uh, for the year 2018. And to make it the point clear, I'm standardizing the household income of white households as $1 and showing how other groups compare uh, to the white population. Asian households have on average $1.23 higher than the white population. Importantly, uh, it's, it's important to keep in mind two factors. One is that the Asian population is heavily made up of immigrants. Almost 70% of Asians in the United States are immigrants. They've come to the United States with high levels of education, one. And two, maybe even more importantly, Asian households are more likely to be multi-generational. So they're more likely than any other group to have multiple persons contributing to household income. So if I were using a per capita measure of, in of income, whites would have the highest income. But if you look at the historically disadvantaged groups, for every dollar of household income white households have, Hispanic or Latino households have 73 cents, and American Indian and black households have 59 cents. What is striking about a 59 cents figure for blacks in 2018 is that it's identical to the black-white gap in income in 1978. 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap in income as a result of the civil rights policies of the 60s and 70s and the anti-poverty policies. And it was reduced to 59 cents in 78. And in 2018, it is still 59 cents. Has it been stuck at 59 cents over time? No. It got worse throughout the decade of the 1980s, um, the, the era of President Reagan. Uh, Reaganomics was not good to the black population, and it was not until the mid-1990s during the Clinton administration that it got back up to 59 cents, and it's been a penny up and down since then. Importantly, the racial gaps in income are much larger than most Americans think. And we have made much less progress since the 1970s than most Americans think. I'm showing you data uh, for some countries in Latin America showing that the pattern 
um, in, the, in the U.S. Is, is not unique. This is showing the percent of adults by the Afro-descended population and the non-Afro-descended population um, in Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, and Uruguay. And in each of those societies, you can see an overrepresentation of the Afro-descended population in that country uh, in terms of the lower levels uh, or the lowest qu quartile of income. And racial gaps in income markedly understate the racial gap in economic status. Um, because income captures the flow of resources into the household, it tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth. And data from the Federal Reserve Board for the United States reveals that for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have 10 cents and Latino households have 12 cents. And the implications of that is when you are low in income and low in wealth, even though we are all in the same storm of the pandemic, we are, we are in different boats. Uh, persons with low economic resources are not as able, uh, not e as equipped to weather the storm. Um, and because if you are low in income and low in wealth, you can be one paycheck away from being homeless, one paycheck away from being able to feed your family. When my career started, most researchers thought that racial ethnic differences in health were simply a function of racial ethnic differences in income and education. We now know that life is more complicated than that, and I will show you data to illustrate that. Here is national data for the United States life expectancy at age 25 for blacks and whites. And what we find is that overall, the average white person at age 25 will live five years longer than the average black person. However, if we look within education, the gap within education is even larger than the gap, um, um, uh, than, the, than the racial gap. Whites with a college degree or more education um, live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. And if we look within the black population, we see a similar pattern, a 5.3 year gap between the most highly educated blacks and those who have not finished high school. So importantly, I'm showing you the data for education, the same is true for income. The gaps by socioeconomic status are larger than the gaps in health by race. At the same time, at every level of education, race still matters. So whites who have dropped out from not completed high school live 3.1 years longer than blacks who have not completed high school. And the gap widens as education increases with the best of blacks, those with a college degree or more education, have lower life expectancy than whites with a college who are college graduates than whites with some college education, than whites who have finished high school. So what do these data tell us? It tells us profoundly that there's something important about economic status, income and education, that matters for your health regardless of your race. But it also tells us that there's something else about race that matters for your health even after you've taken income and education into account. And so researchers have been asking and, and gathering empirical data to answer the question, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of these racial inequities in health that also exists in so many other domains of society? When I use the term racism, I think of it as a system, an organized system that categorizes and ranks, devalues and disempowers some groups, empowering others, and differentially allocating opportunities and resources uh, to groups based on an ideology of inferiority, the belief that some groups are superior and others are inferior. This leads at a societal level to negative attitudes and beliefs uh, within individuals and within our larger culture, prejudice and stereotypes, and it leads to differential treatment by uh, discrimination by both individuals and social institutions. So let me illustrate the ways in which racism uh, plays out and, and the role that, that structural and these upstream mechanisms uh, of racism 
um, have consequences in our society. Importantly, I am arguing that racism is, is, is a societal system similar to other major systems. Uh, the arrows go in both directions, that it shapes and is reshaped, uh, it, it shapes and reshapes um, uh, these systems, and, and there is this symbiotic relationship uh, between the two. One of the mechanisms by which racism um, uh, operates, by which I will spend most of my time today, but also highlight it's only one of the mechanisms, and they often work synergistically, um, is the structural or upstream institutional mechanisms um, of, of, of racism. And the question is, well, what does that have to do with health, and how can that contribute to health inequities? I want to talk to you about one mechanism that is important historically in the United States. It's called residential segregation. Um, there were laws and regulations um, that determined where someone could live based on their race. There were restrictions on where blacks and Native Americans, for example, historically could live based on, 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 on their race. And although that system has been deemed illegal by civil rights legislation in the 1960s, the structure that developed in the 19th century and was well entrenched in place in the 19, by the 1940s is still largely intact in the United States. A historian at Duke University writing a book about the origins of segregation in the U.S. South and South Africa argued that this system of residential segregation was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States. And you says, well, how does segregation work? Think of segregation at a community level as a burglar at midnight. It shows up in a community, and once segregation uh, becomes evident in that community, multiple valuable resources disappear, like quality schools and safe playgrounds and good jobs and a healthy environment and access to safe housing and high quality transportation and health care. Research in the United States indicates that all of these desirable resources vary dramatically by the place where one lives. Um, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson pictured here are two eminent sociologists at Harvard University. They conducted a study of the largest cities in the United States and they reported there's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to those of blacks. And they concluded that the worst urban context with, in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities, just showing how powerfully segregation shapes access to opportunity. Now, if someone's paying attention, that was a 1995 study, and someone might say, have things changed over time? So I'm going to draw on work of Professor Dolores Acevedo Garcia. Uh, this is a 2020 uh, paper. She has created an opportunity index for the United States for every county in the U.S., uh, ranked on 29 different indicators of access to opportunity. Things like the quality of schools and the uh, high school graduation rates and the employment rate and home ownership rate and uh, uh, median income level and the quality of the environment in terms of air, water, soil pollution, and access to resources for green, uh, for health, such as green space and healthy food outlets and walkability and so on. These are just some examples of the 29 indicators that she's put together in one database. And what she has shown is that if we look at the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, and we ask which children live in very low and low opportunity neighborhoods. We find that 67%, two thirds of all black children, 58% of all Latino kids, 53% of all Native American children live in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods compared to one in five white and Asian kids. If we ask who are the children in the 100 largest metro areas in the United States, living in high and very high opportunity neighborhoods, we see the flip side. Almost two-thirds of all white and Asian kids and only about one in five black and Latino kids live in very high or high opportunity neighborhoods. So where you live is a dramatic predictor of access to opportunity in the United States. In fact, research indicates that segregation 
is the central driver of the large racial ethnic differences in income and education that we observe in the first place. David Cutler is an economist at Harvard University. He completed a national study of young African Americans and whites uh, making it in the labor force. Using very rigorous statistical methods, he's able to show statistically if you could er erase uh, residential segregation, you would completely um, eliminate black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. All of those striking differences are linked to opportunity at the neighborhood level. Another Harvard economist, Raj Chetty, um, has done an intergenerational study. He has looked over time at um, using uh, national data of the census and has asked, let's look at black and white children in the United States. And let's compare those who begin life in households that have the similar level of household income. So he's controlling for parental income. And then he asked the question, how is this next generation doing? And what he finds that in 99% of census tracts in America, census tracts is a geographic grouping of the census. So in virtually 99% of large neighborhood areas, um, black boys have lower levels of earning than their white counterparts, even after you've taken uh, parental income into account. Why? They live in neighborhoods that differ in access to opportunity. Black boys do as well as white boys in the second generation. If they are in neighborhoods with good resources, the challenge is there are essentially no such neighborhoods in the United States, or very few of them, I should say. So what I'm saying is the large inequities we see in income and education that matter for life and health in the United States do not reflect a broken system. No, they reflect a carefully crafted system, functioning as planned, successfully implementing social policies, many of which are rooted in racism. So these inequities, large racial inequities we see, are not accidents. They are not random events. They're not acts of God. They reflect the ways in which this upstream structural mechanism of racism has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. And I just want to illustrate how that system permeates so much access to opportunity. So I'm going to focus on South Los Angeles, a very segregated community in the Los Angeles uh, County. This area has a high population of blacks and Latinos. Um, it has 10 times fewer physicians than the average US community. It has a severe shortage of primary care uh, doctors and, and a severe shortage of specialists. Um, a low number of hospital beds per population compared to other communities in Los Angeles County. It has three times more diabetes than the rest uh, of similar communities in California. And diabetic amputation is among the most frequent surgical procedure performed at the local hospital. And the challenge that local hospital faces is that Medicaid is the most common insurance. Medicaid in the United States is an insurance that is, is provided by the government for persons who are very poor. Um, it does not reimburse well, and many healthcare providers in the United States don't even accept it. Just to illustrate the, the, how poor uh, the, this insurance uh, uh, provides reimbursement for healthcare providers. The average emergency room visit in Los Angeles, uh, a provider or, or health, uh, uh, hospital system would receive $2,000 from a commercial insurer, $650 from Medicare, a program that takes care of the elderly, but only $150 from Medicaid. So what I'm saying is when there's a population that's targeted and don't have access to good em employment opportunities in the United States context, where good insurance comes from a good job, then they are disadvantaged, and then the government facilitates that disadvantage by poorly reimbursing um, the, the care uh, that the, they will receive. And this lifelong reduced access to quality and, and quality care 
leads to poor management of disease and to worse outcomes. So the historic and ongoing underfunding of care in segregated communities has created a separate and unequal health system. Research also indicates that when people are of low economic status and they live in disadvantaged segregated neighborhoods, they have higher levels of exposure and greater clustering of all kinds of stressors, economic stressors like difficulty making ends meet at the end of the month or losing one's job, psychosocial stressors like the death of loved ones, and physical and chemical stressors like exposure to air pollution. And so I've talked about the way in which structural institutional racism through segregation has these negative effects. But it also collaborates with discrimination at the individual level, uh, which is an added source of toxic stress. A measure of discrimination, it doesn't comprehensively capture it, it captures only one aspect, is the everyday discrimination scale that Professor Castro mentioned I developed. It's nine items that captures little indignities, being treated with less courtesy and respect, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores, people acting as if they think you are not smart or they are afraid of you or they think you are dishonest. And what research reveals that this, li these little indignities add up and lead to poorer health. I'm showcasing the work of one researcher, Professor Tenny Lewis at Emory University, and she shows that everyday discrimination, those little incidents, if someone scores high on them, it leads to more rapid development of heart disease as measured by coronary artery calcification, or higher levels of inflammation, or higher levels of blood pressure. Pregnant women who report everyday discrimination while they're pregnant give birth to lower birth weight infants, one study of adults followed over time, high levels of everyday discrimination is an independent predictor of premature death. So just these little indignities chipping away at the indignity of individuals over time leads um, to earlier death. And it leads to a broad range of conditions. By the way, in multiple studies around the world, including studies in Brazil, the everyday discrimination scale has been used in a number of studies in Brazil. But there are other ways in which this discrimination has long-term negative effects. Here is a study done by Professor Brandisha Tynes from USC. She studied black and Latinx adolescents, and she looked at the frequency in which they viewed online images of someone of their racial group who was beaten by the police, arrested or detained, or being shot by the police. And higher exposure to these videos in the prior year was associated with an elevated risk of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms and depressive symptoms. So negative effects on their mental health. Uh, think of it as spillover effects of the larger exposure to discrimination in society. And then here is another study that I did with, with other colleagues. Um, we linked a database of every police shooting in the United States uh, uh, over a three-year window, and we linked that to another database of the mental health of the population in every state. And we were able to document that every police shooting of an unarmed black person led to worse mental health, not just for the family and friends, but for the entire black population in which, uh, in the state in which that had occurred, and the worst mental health was evident for three months. So again, long-term negative effects. So I've talked about structural institutional racism and segregation, and it creates inequities. It collaborates with individual discrimination that produces other types of race-related stressors. And then there's the larger discrimination within the culture, the stereotypes and the beliefs of groups that triggers negative um, uh, experiences of, of bias and discrimination. And this plays out within multiple social institutions in our society. Unequal Treatment is a report published by the National Academy of Medicine in the United States in 2003 that documented pervasive discrimination for blacks and other minorities within the healthcare system. I'm showing you one recent study to show this pattern persist. It's a study of 1.8 million hospital births in the state of Florida. The study found that when cared for by white doctors, 
black babies are three times more likely than white newborns to die in the hospital. This disparity is cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. And so all of these mechanisms, the structural mechanisms and the racism embedded within our culture and the individual discrimination, they create inequities on a broad scale um, that have consequences for so many domains of society. They reinforce the existence of the inequities, reinforce the stereotypes, and helps to maintain the system of racism in the first place. So what can we do about this? Let me talk quickly about strategies within the healthcare system, um, and I will only elaborate on one, diversifying the workforce to meet the needs of all patients. I want to share with you a high quality study, a randomized controlled trial. It was done in Oakland, California. They took 1,300 black men, gave them a coupon to go for a health screening at a Saturday clinic. When they got to the clinic, they were randomized either to see a black doctor or a doctor of another race. Those who saw a black doctor were more likely to talk about other health problems, more likely to do screening for diabetes, more likely to get a flu vaccine, more likely to do screening for cholesterol. So greater engagement with the healthcare system and receiving greater benefit when there was racial concordance. What else can we do? We need to build what I call community immunity. By that I mean we need to create communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that have created inequities in health in the first place. If segregation is such a fundamental driver, we need to enrich the quality of neighborhood environments. We need to increase economic development in poor areas. We need to improve housing quality. Um, there's a lot that can be done, um, and I will comment in, in detail on two of them, investing in early childhood and improving neighborhood and housing conditions. This is a study, randomized control trial. They took poor children, 80% of them black, at birth, placed them, half of them, into a nurturing environment of good nutrition, good pediatric care, good intellectual stimulation. By the mid-30s, birth through five is the intervention. By the mid-30s, those who got it have lower risk of cardiovascular disease. They're also doing better economically, better vocationally, linked to the enhancement that they received uh, birth through five. There's a recent proposal in the United States for baby bonds. Uh, economist Derek Hamilton have proposed it, and the state of Connecticut and the District of Columbia have implemented it. And that is, the government will establish a trust fund for each poor baby born in that state or, or in the D.C. area, and they expect by age 18 this would accumulate to at least about $10,000 that could be used for a broad range of, of, of economic benefits for that individual in society. And finally, I want to comment on the centrality of improving neighborhood and housing conditions. Here is a study that was done um, several years ago that showed if you took poor people and just change the neighborhood context, that's all, move them to a less poor neighborhood, no health intervention, 10 to 15 years later, their health is better, lower obesity, lower diabetes risk, just by changing the neighborhood. And there's good evidence that we can improve neighborhood and housing conditions. I'm not going to go into the detail of this one, but this one is purpose-built uh, communities that shows the dramatic transformation of a neighborhood and that has had rapid effects on health. What this model shows, it's possible to change all of the challenges faced by poor communities simultaneously. We can work across silos of improving education, housing, public safety, child care, employment, and nutrition. We can have and implement comprehensive, integrated, place-based solutions. We can create high-quality educational outcomes in those poor neighborhoods, and we can make things affordable uh, for low-income households. There's a dramatic example of a hospital that is implementing a similar system. I don't have time to discuss in detail, but I leave you with the words of Martin Luther King. He points out that what is needed is more than, than just a, a, a sympathy. 
He says, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. The inequities we see are produced by larger upstream structural mechanisms, and we need to work together to restructure them. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, David, for covering such a complex topic, talking about drivers, consequences, and, and ways to mitigate racism. Uh, thank you a lot. So this was the US view. Um, and again, I, I introduced uh, uh, Professor Almeida before. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. So now let's hear uh, the perspective from Brazil. Um, very happy to have you with us, Dr. Almeida. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marcia, David, uh, Thiago. It's a great pleasure to me to be here with you. Uh, David, uh, your presentation is very, very good, essential. Thank you so much. So uh, I think uh, between us, there are many, many coincidences, many, uh, many convergences between the problem of structural racism, uh, because in my vision, I'm not a, a social scientist, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer and a philosopher. Uh, so uh, I intend to discuss the problem uh, on structural racism in a theoretical uh, framework to try to, to create lens that can provide us the, the necessary uh, instruments to understand the similarities and the difference between the structural races in Brazil and United States because, uh, because uh, the similarities uh, uh, can, uh, can explain the, the structural races in Brazil and United States, but the difference are important to, to uh, to provide us the specific strategies to struggle against institutional and structural racism too. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to participate in this event. I want to thank the University of Harvard and Columbia and all the organizers of this event. Uh, my special greetings uh, again to professors uh, Marcy Castro, David Williams, uh, Thiago Lucio, and Gustavo Zeng. I intend to carry out my intervention and structural racism in Brazil approaching three points very briefly, very briefly. Uh, and three points are what is structural racism? This is the first point. Uh, David, we, again, we have many convergence uh, about uh, what, what uh, structural racism is. Two, my two point is, what are the similarities between Brazil and the United States regarding the manifestations of structural, structural racism? And the third point is, what differentiates the manifestations of structural racism in Brazil and the United States? My approach of this third point is a philosophical, theoretical approach. The first point, what is structural racism? A comparison between Brazil and the United States with regard to racism is only possible if we are equipped with the create theoretical and conceptual instruments. Thus, it is essential to define what structural racism is. If it's true that there are no races in the biological sense, the idea of race is a political and ideological construction. Race is a product of history and the political trends in our world. Race was and continues to be a fundamental instrument for the exercise of political power and the naturalization of social inequalities. 
In this way, racism is the historical and political process by which race reproduces and gains meaning in our world. Please, um, I I demand attention to three words in the definition of structural racism. The words process, historical, and political. That words are decisive to define what the structural of racism is. First, process. Process because racism cannot be reduced to an individual act or a set of acts. Racism is part of the constitution of individuals and institutions too. Historical, why historical is important? Because racism does not manifest itself in the same way everywhere in the world. It's a very important point. It is necessary to observe how the social, political, economic, and cultural context influences the process of racialization. Different countries, different social formations, and different process of racializations. I often warn my white colleagues in Brazil that they are not white in the United States. Whites in Brazil aren't white in the United States. Because United States in Brazil are a result of the same process of social, social formation, social constitution, of the modern frameworks, modern countries, contemporary countries, but the materialization of each country um, produces a different process of racialization. Race relations are both global and local. The classification of individuals as white and no white depends on a series of political, legal, economic, and cultural mechanisms that act differently depending on the historical context. So uh, it's uh, essential to understand the specificities of politics, legal organizations, economic organizations, and cultural frameworks to understand how race, how white people, how non-white people materializes yourself in each social reality. The third word, political. Political because as a systemic process of discriminations that influences the organization of society, it depends on political power. Otherwise, systematic discrimination against entire social groups would be impracticable without power. So the idea of reverse racism is absolutely meaningless. There is a big misunderstanding in this idea because members of minority racial groups may even be prejudiced or discriminated, but they cannot impose social disadvantage or members of other majority groups, either directly or indirectly. White men do not lose job vacancies because they are white. White people are not suspected of criminal acts because of their racial status. 
nor are their intelligence or professional capacity due to their skin color. So the consequence is race is a concept whose meaning can only be understood from a relational perspective. That is, the race is not a delusion or a creation of the head of malicious people. How they've said is not an act of God. It's a social relationship, which means to say that race manifests itself in concrete acts that take place within a social structure made up of conflicts. Made up of conflicts. It means to say that racism is not abnormality, abnormality or an individual act of a racist. If racism is a political process, it is part of the structures of power. That is political, economic, legal, and even family relations. What is called unconscious basis is a product of society's racist organization. Imagine that we live in a world in which Blacks are not in positions of power and presses. They are constantly portrayed as underlings or as criminals. It is obvious that the tendency of people, even non-racist people, is to think of minorities from this place built by society. Racism produces our imaginary and our feelings towards the others. Racism is a question of desire to be. Racism constitutes our desire, the forms of desire in the world. Racism is effective because it is also aesthetic. That is why I have supported the idea that issues such as democracy, inequality, development, and public policies can only be dealt with broadly if they include reflection on racism. There is no a conversation, a true conversation about democracy without the racial question is not in cause. I believe that the protest is starting, for example, the protest starting in the West demonstrate the extreme character of racism. However, the use of the term structure does not mean that racism is an unavoidable condition and that anti racist institutional actions and policies are useless. Or that individuals who commit discriminatory acts should not be held personally responsible. To say this would be to deny, to say what, well, to say that the structure is, uh, to, uh, turns the, the racist an unavoidable thing. Um, is to deny the social, historical, and, and political aspects of racism. What we want to emphasize from the theoretical point of view is that racism as a historical and political process creates the social conditions so that directly or indirectly, racially identified groups are systematically discriminated against. How do individuals who commit racist acts are held accountable? The structural view of race relations leads us to conclude that legal responsibility is not enough for society to stop being a machine that produces racial inequality. The law is not enough to deal with racism. 
legal frameworks, legal reforms is not enough to deal with racism. Saying that racism is structural does not relieve us of the responsibility to observe our behaviors or company guidelines. The purpose of this more complex look is to avoid superficial and reductionist anal 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 analysis on the racial issue that in addition to, to not contributing to the understanding of the problem, make the fight against racism very difficult. As Anthony Giddens, the, so the sociologist Anthony, Anthony Giddens, states, the structure is enabling, not just restrictive. In this case, in addition to measures that curb racism individually and institutionally, it's imperative to reflect on profound changes in social, political, and economic relations uh, can take place. Institutions reproduce the conditions for establishing and maintaining social order. Thus, if it is possible to speak of institu institutional racism, it means that institutions in position of racial rules and standards and somehow linked to the social order that is seeks to safeguard. Just as the institution's performance is conditioned to a previously existing social structure. The races that this institution may express is also part of that same structure. Institutions are racist because society is racist. This seemingly obvious phrase has several implications. Institutions are racist because society is racist. What implications? The first is that if there are institutions whose standards of function result in rules that favor certain racial groups, it's because racism is part of social order. It is not something created by institution, but it's reproduced by it. But let the reservation be made. The social structure is constituted by innumerable, innumerable conflicts, class conflicts, racial conflicts, sexual conflicts, which means that institutions can also act in a conflict manner, positioning themselves within the conflict in an anti-racist manner. In other words, it's possible to, uh, to activate anti-racist acts inside the institutions, inside the conflicts, in the institutions. So, what the similarities between Brazil and United States when we, we talk about institutional or structural racism? The comparison is not possible because we can ask ourselves about how racism was part of the social formation of Brazil and the USA. Both Brazil and USA are the countries, are countries that result from modern slavery and conflicts resulting from the constitution of capitalist societies in the contemporary world. US and Brazil are children of the Atlantic and its revolutions. The economic, legal, political, and cultural structures of Brazil and the United States are the results of this process in which slavery played a fundamental role. And even, uh, even after the abolition of slavery, both countries constituted institutions that maintained and still maintain racial inequality. 
the, the, the current racial inequalities in Brazil, the United States, are not, uh, uh, are not only the result of slavery, are the result of current institutions that fun function with racist way, racist frameworks, reproducing racist, uh, racist in uh, the quotidian of their functions. And it's good to say, racist kills in both countries. Racism is a form to kill. Organize the death in both countries in different manners, different ways, but racism kills. The difference. The difference, however, are accentuated and depending on a look at how social structures were constituted in different social racial formations. This concept is very important. Historical racial formations. Brazil, United States uh, uh, have different historical racial formations. From an economic point of view, a comparison between races in Brazil and the United States should observe four points. The difference. First, the position of the countries in the world economy and world geopolitics is essential. The second difference when we we compare the historical racial formation of the United States, the demography. The third point of comparison, the function of political and legal institutions uh, is very important to, um, to understand in both countries, how the legal institutions organize the racial conflicts. There is no structural races without legal institutions. The legal institutions organize the racial frameworks. The fourth point of comparison, the cultural framework, different cultures, different, uh, different forms to be, for example, to be a black person. It's different to be a black person in Brazil and to be a black person in the United States. It's different to, to feel as a black person in United States and Brazil. Four points to, to remember. The, the world economy, the, the, the position of the world economy and geopolitics, the demography, the function of political and legal institutions, the cultural frameworks. The United States is the richest, most militarily powerful and most industrialized country in the world understand the importance of the industrial process in Brazil and United States, it's essential to understand the difference between race and Brazil and United States. The fantasies about race, many fantasies about, about race, many delusions about race, even Brazil and United States are produced uh, during the industrial process in each country. Notice the position, uh, the current position of the United States implies in different historical dynamics of class, culture, and work organization. Very important point. 
they will uh, say the said about it uh, in, in another way, but the work organization is very important to understand the dynamics of racism. Demographically, black people in Brazil are self-declared 56% of the population. While in the US, 13%. Class and race are not connect, connected uh, differently in Brazil and the US due to economic difference. This is the numbers of unemployment, poverty, health markers, they've said about it, access to education and political representation. Uh, for example, in Brazil, uh, in Brazil, uh, four five percent wage gap between whites. There, there is a four or five percent wage gap between whites and blacks, according to the twenty nine National Household Central Survey. Uh, this difference cannot be attributed solely to the lack of training opportunities for black people, as a liberal discourse. According to a calculation by Instituto Locomotiva for research, the salary, the salary difference is still significant at 31% when comparing the salaries of whites and blacks with higher education is related from all other variables. Only skin color remains. Unemployment and under uh, under uh, utilization rates also have higher rates among blacks and part of black people in Brazil. Despite being just over half of the workforce, 54 uh, percent, they form about they, the black people, uh, more than uh, more than seventy percent of the unemployed and underutilized, underutilized in the workforce in twenty eighteen. Regarding the composite rate of underutilization, which is the sum of an underemployed, unemployed, the unemployed and potential out of work population among blacks, it was twenty nine against. 18 among whites. Black also have more informal jobs than white. The extreme poverty in the country grew by 13% uh, 13 uh, from 5% per, uh, uh, of the population in 2012, according to the international line set by the World Bank. As for the line uh, of Five dollars uh, 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 PPC. There was a reduction in the proportion of poor people of around six point six percent, falling to when twenty six percent to twenty four percent of the population this period. Among those who declared themselves white, third uh, third percent were extremely poor, and fourteen were poor. But these incidents more than doubled between blacks and browns. The population of black or brown color or race is more present in informality, has fewer years of study, is in that activists pay less. So all this contributes to lower incomes from work. So, uh, it's also interesting to observe how the formation of race in Brazil is linked to their uh, respective modernization process, different racial historical formation, different process of racialization. The dilemmas about the industrial economy in the West resulted in a civil war that in the 19th century created a radical separation between blacks and whites as a form of composition of national conflicts. The separation between blacks and whites in the United States was a form of national composition. In Brazil, its position uh, in Latin America 
meant that the country had to deal with racialization in terms of mestizare, racial democracy, a particularity of Latin America racial discourse, but which was appropriated by each country in a specific way. In Brazil, the discourse of mestizare that was essential in the social formations in Latin America was appropriated as racial democracy. Racial democracy uh, until the, the, the military dictatorship. If violence against black people is common in both countries, it's important to emphasize that the maintenance of inequality is in a country with 56% of the black population and a smaller uh, economy leads to brutal forms of daily violence. So the Brazilian state is, is, um, is a state of violence, quotidian violence against black population, against poor population in Brazil. Um, a violence which are treated with a normality. Normality is normal. The violence is normal in Brazil. An example, the black population is the largest in the country, representing 56% uh, of uh, millions of inhabitants, but is also the most victimized. This study, Armed Violence and Racism, the Role of Firearms in Racial Inequality by Instituto Sol da Paz in Brazil, Sol da Paz Institute in Brazil, shows that uh, 30,000 30, 30, murders by armed aggression in 2019. Death of 30,000 murders by armed aggression in 2019, 78% were against Black people. 78% of 30,000 murders were against black people in Brazil. Conclusion. Conclusion is, uh, conclusions. Despite being different, the West, uh, despite being different, uh, the West and Brazil have their fates linked. Difference lead to lead us to, to think about specific strategies to combat racism in each country. The problems in Brazil are different. So for example, affirmative actions, the form of racial quotas for us in Brazil is essential. For us in Brazil, were almost, uh, uh, was almost a revolution, a social revolution. The uh, affirmative action in forms of quotas in universities, especially. For us, was and is essential to maintain the affirmative actions and the quotas in universities, in the public universities in Brazil. In Brazil, the main universities in Brazil are public universities. So to fight against racism is essential to expand the public education in Brazil, to expand the social politics in Brazil in general. Because Brazil, in comparison to the United States, is a poor country. So the social politics in Brazil, in Brazil, the social and public health system is essential to struggle against racism. In Brazil, if, if, if in Brazil, the health system, this, the public health system with gratitude was revo revocated, was um, finished, the poor and the black people were penalized. So, the struggle against racism in Brazil depends on 
a public and free health system for everyone. The increase or in inequality has increasingly incited conflicts and hampered the mediation hall of institutions. In Brazil, we can see the advance of white supremacist discourse from new Nazi strikes, including in the current government. There is a, there's a, there's a, there's a new framework in Brazil, the uh, Nazi discourse in the public space openly, open. Is, is new, is new. So it reflects the, 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 uh, the, the crisis of the social mediation, the social institutions, not only in Brazil, but in all the world. So the efforts to struggle against racism is a global effort. We need the United States. We need the black population of the United States. We need to, uh, to, to make a global effort to combat racism in Brazil and the United States. Different problems, but the same fate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Silvio, Dr. Almeida. Um, so I guess I have a million questions, but there, there are questions on the chat. I just want to say um, a couple of things. So I, I think from a health perspective, something that comes across from both of what you said is that we have what we usually call social diseases, diseases that only exist because we fail to address the root causes of the problem. And some of them are what David mentioned, the, the quality of the house, it's the quality of the neighborhood. Cholera is one example. We should have zero cases of cholera, but we still have it. That's a, a typical example of a social disease. And um, uh, I mean, from what you said, um, um, Silvio, there, there are so many notes that I made, but I think um, you mentioned that there is no Converse, true conversation about democracy that doesn't include race. And I think just, just that sentence is, you know, makes it very clear that 2022 is probably one of the most important years in for democracy for everything in Brazil because we have we have elections. So thank you for saying that sentence because I think there's it, it carries many different things. It carries education, it carries healthcare. He carries everything. He carries the, the housing quality, the neighborhood quality that, that um, David mentioned. So I, I think that's extremely important. Um, so I'll save my questions. I probably gonna email you later, but um, I'm, I want to address the questions from the audience. Um, so uh, David, there are a few questions for you. One is if you believe that whites, um, that's from uh, uh, Donna McLean, if whites experience no adverse psychological effects, um, unlike blacks, when it comes to the impact of crime. And, and another connected question from Ronnie um, Coelho is, um, how do you see in the near future the research in racial health inequality. Do you see increasing interest on the subject? What are the trends and the limits? So let's start with you, David, addressing those two. And then um, there's uh, also questions for Silvio. Sure, thank you so much. And and thank you, Silvio, your, your talk was brilliant. Um, uh, I was just taking notes feverishly uh, trying to capture some of the gems that 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 you provided um, in your talk, really. Um, we will be talking further. <laughs> it's nice to meet you in this context. So let me get to the questions. Um, is there any impact of of, <clears throat> of um, for whites uh, impact of of, of crime? Um, this is what we know. Most crime in the United States. Um, occurs within each racial group. So most whites who are victims of crime are victimized by a white person, a white assailant. 
most blacks who are victims of crime are victimized by a black person. But, but that's the reality. That's the statistics. That does not capture what is the dominant stereotypes and the dominant frameworks that, that people make. And, and, and part of the reason for, for, for segregation, uh, it was driven by a desire to protect white people, especially white women. Uh, from this marauding masses of black people um, and scary black men and what they might do and, and rape white women. So, so images of, and, and stereotypes and beliefs about crime have been one source of shaping just even the policies that have been uh, established in the United States. But, but in reality, the, the, the th most crimes occur within, uh, especially in a segregated society, occurs within, uh, within each, each racial group. Um, the, the other question that was asked was about increasing interest. There is absolutely no question. When I started to write about um, uh, racism in the um, early 1990s, figure it, 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 making the case that this was an important and neglected um, a topic, I could count on one hand the researchers in the United States who were doing work on racism. And there was not as much occurring uh, outside uh, of, of the US. Today, it is difficult for me to keep up with the research literature on the topic because there literally is an explosion of research, not just in the United States, but around the world. So there is absolutely no question that there has been a dramatic increase and George Floyd's death that, that brought the reality, the visceral reality of, of, of what black people have been suffering for centuries, brought it to the, the television screen and, and, and to our, our digital devices, just made it so, so clear to the population that that has led to an even greater increase uh, of research in this, in this space. So yes, there's definitely uh, a great increase globally um, in, in work on this topic. Thank you, David. So, so now I'm gonna ask two questions to Silvio. So one um, from Mawang, the question relates to the fact that in Brazil, we also have the term mulatto, mixed race. Um, and the question is if um, whether the discriminations, personal and structural, vary based on uh, if the person is black or mulatto, and if you could talk a little bit about the structural racism against um, indigenous peoples. The second question, I think it relates, um, so the question broadly asks about um, the laws that have been done against racism and, and, and what makes segregation still exist today despite the laws. And I'll go back to something else you said. You said the law is not enough to deal with racism. So I think this question address a little bit of that. So the, 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 the mulatto and indigenous and the issue of the law. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, the, 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 the observations, uh, the David's observations is, is very, uh, very exciting because David, uh, what defines, uh, what, what does define uh, what crime, uh, what is crime? What, what's crime? What's crime? Crime is not a fact Crime is not uh, an act. Crime is a legal definition that depends on an institutional decision. So, uh, crime uh, kill people uh, can be uh, a crime or not. Self defense, for example, it depends on the forms of classification and, uh, and the classification is an institutional decision. Judge, prosecutors, lawyers, institution, institutional racism. So um, uh, 
historical explanations about it uh, can be uh, can be encountered in the uh, in the phenomenon that we can call hatanism, the fear of Haiti, the fear of black people, the fear, the fear of black people, the fear of indigenous people is very important to 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 provide. Uh, institutional union to provide institutional defense, a national defense. So the fear of black, the fear of the stranger, the fear is a specific way to organize the institution of the, 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 the in defense of society as a, a expression of Foucault, yeah, Foucault expression. In defense of society, we need racism. The, the, racism is a need of uh, social union in, or in your times. Yeah? So, um, uh, um, about the, 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 the visibility of the George Floyd's case, I, I, I agree with you, uh, David. Uh, I remember that uh, the philosopher Cornel West used the expression perfect storm to define the visibility of the George Floyd's case because we have, we, we have, we have <laughs> a current uh, races, growth of inequality, pandemic, and Trump. So a perfect storm. In Brazil, Bolsonaro. So you understand? The tragedy. So uh, about mulatto, uh, Negro mulatto, uh, black mulatto. So, um, I referred about process, different process of racialization. In Latin America, uh, we have a particular way to determine the racialization. Mestizaje. Walter Miolo says, uh, a mestizaje was a way to create the white of second class in Latin America. You understand? The white of second class in Latin America. The white, the, the white people is white in their countries. In Brazil, white, white people in Brazil. But white people in Brazil is Latino in Latin America, in, in the United States, for example. So, mulatto, creole, is formed to deal with the, the idea of mestizaje there was a very important idea to configure a nation, configure nations in Latin America. In Brazil, the black social movement uh, made up a good strategy to deal with this, the racial conflicts. The black social movement creates the term Negro, Negro, to refer to uh, mulatos and people with darker skin. So, because Negro is a political category, is not a biological category. The black social movement uh, fight for the categorization, uh, Negro categorization. So uh, it turned to, to possible to deal with the contradictions uh, about racism. Uh, uh, about the indigenous people. In Latin America, it's necessary to understand uh, race uh, with black people 
an indigenous people. In many, in some places in Brazil, it's very difficult to to define uh, the, to, to determine the difference between black and indigenous in Brazil. Uh, there is a, a, a image that illustrates it. Uh, please uh, let me to to share with you. Uh, check with you this image. It's very important. Uh, Okay, let me see. This image I share with you. This is a black guy or an indigenous guy. Oshossi, the religious entity of Candomblé, is the same way, in the same body, a black person, an indigenous person too. That's in the process of racial formation. For this reason, Lélia Gonzalez said, when uh, when she refers to uh, to black, uh, the condition, the racial condition in Latin America, um, Lela Gonzalez says, Americanity, Americanity, the mix between to be American, indigenous people, okay, and African. The Africanity is Americanity in Latin America, in Brazil especially. Okay. So, um, that's it. Okay. Marcia, I yeah. wanted to comment just briefly on the skin color question. Yes, I was going to ask exactly that one. Yeah, there, is, there is some research on that in the United States um, that finds within the black population, persons of darker skin color um, experience higher levels of discrimination than if they are black but of lighter skin color. Uh, there was a study uh, from the National Study of Black Americans. It was the first sci social scientific study done in 1979-80. And it found that skin color, you know, in general, in, in, in stratification studies, looking at the achievements of the next generation, parental economic background is a powerful predictor. This study found that skin color, especially for women, was a stronger predictor of adult income and occupational status than parental economic background. Um, and it was more so for women. It didn't predict adult education, but it predicted income and occupational status. So, so skin color matters. Um, one of my uh, postdoctoral fellows um, recently wrote a paper um, looking at skin color within the Latino population in the United States. And we find greater inequities for those of darker uh, skin color. So skin color does seem to matter. And one other line of work I would mention is that there are some studies that have asked individuals, not only what race are you, but what race do most people think you are? And what they find, so it's the societal perception, not your personal uh, yes. perception that perfect, that perfect. Uh, for those groups uh, who report that they are Latino or they are indigenous, but most people think they are white, that they, we don't see the same disparities that we see for the same uh, person from the same group um, who who report that most people see themselves as Hispanic or Latino or see themselves as indigenous. So uh, the societal perception does seem to matter uh, for outcomes. Yeah, yes, race. Uh, so, sorry, race is a social relation. Yes. Social relation. Social relation in a specific in specific conditions, different social process of racialization. So. Exactly. So thank thank you both for saying this for uh, the the Brazilians in the in the in the room. There is a book. Uh, from um, Antonio Carlos Almeida. It was an experiment. It's called A Cabeça do Brasileiro, so the, yeah, the head of the Brazilian. And there's a whole, there's more than one chapter about race, but there is one that is a striking, and it's nine photos of a very white to a very dark skin, and there are different contexts that are simulated 
and you always have three options. So uh, who would you like your, uh, your daughter to marry? And, and then you have situations in which the poorest is the, is the darker skin and situations when the poorest is the lighter skin. It's a must read because all the bias of the society just by the color of your skin intertwined with socioeconomic status is right there. Um, so anyway, um, I am sorry for all the questions we didn't answer. I, I am glad that I finally could connect with Silvio, although remotely, and I put David and Silvio in touch. Yes. I think this triangle is going to be in a heavy action in the coming days, but I, I want to oh, thank, thank both of you. Uh, it's an important topic. I feel like we needed five hours to cover <laughs> everything we need to cover, but that's an important topic. This discussion has to keep going. And as a Brazilian, as I mentioned before, we need to have those conversations because that is an extremely important year for the future of our country. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we can do what the US did with change things along the way and, and, and hope for a brighter future. So Silvio, David, thank you so much. Thank you all for um, thank you. Uh, attending the meeting. Stay well. Thank you.